Um, this came from a conversation that I was having where we were talking about um, hacking the human brain and I'd, some marketing stuff I'd been doing and then how that related to um, fishing. And from that came, uh, oh, why don't you come and have a conversation with these guys? And little did I know it was going to be a room full of experts. So, um, you know, while I blather on and we've got folks in the room, feel free to add stuff later when we get to the chatting. So um, normally I say who I am. Um, most of you probably already know me. Um, wrote a book, got to be an Amazon bestseller, got a load of prizes, occasionally wore dresses. And got to meet the, the, the Queen and um, Prince Charles, who I think gave me COVID. So if I'd have died, I'd have been killed by the King. Um, for those who don't know what we actually do, um, Titania were um, the first people, as in Ian, the uh, gorgeous, sexy guy who I married in the middle next to the Queen. Um, we were the first people to really automate build reviews on firewall switches and routers. And Ian came from a Czech team leader background, and so that's what we did. And these are the sort of people that we do it for. And the thing is, we wouldn't have got to be a successful company if we hadn't somewhere along the line learned that um, people buy emotionally and people buy from people. So I spent quite a lot of time talking about neuromarketing to technical people because we often suck at it. Um, so I do a lot of talking in cyber accelerators and that's often because we come up with really, really brilliant things just like Ian did. And then we talk really technically at people and think that we've got our message across, but it then doesn't lead to sales. So we had to learn somewhere along the lines that that's not, how people buy and this is what I learned so <laughs> um, we've actually got two different decision-making processes embedded in our brains and I learned this some time ago um, really in my teens because I didn't know why people made god-awful decisions as far as I was concerned I also didn't know I was autistic um, which would explain why my mind seemed to work a little bit differently to everybody else's. So I spent quite a lot of time studying the human operating system and trying to understand why people did what they did. So I was kind of studying neuromarketing and psychology at, at 16. And I'm kind of 50 next year. So I've spent a lot of time understanding this stuff. And what I found really, really fascinating um, is the fact that these two minds that we have form in our womb separately and then join together. So we've got our logical mind that is um, here represented for those people who aren't into Star Trek by Spock, which is uh, not an elf, he's a pointy-eared Vulcan. And our logical mind essentially spends a lot of time um, trying to make decisions rationally. So it uses deduction and logical approaches and um, reasoned decision making um, than our emotional response, which in this case would be Dr. McCoy. Um, and our emotional response um, is, is really our primate mind. Or our... Where I um, was talking about then is that this chimp mind is always making decisions emotionally. So I don't know whether anybody's read this, but there's a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And essentially this talks about these two minds that we have. Um, the logical mind that is our slow thinker, our reason thinker, and our emotional mind that is our down and dirty um, thinker. And what's really interesting, or what I found really interesting, is that some of our most important decisions we actually make emotionally and some of our least important decisions we tend to make logically and you think well how does that work so using an example from um, real life when you buy a house which for most people is your biggest purchase um, that you would make as a human um, you tend to walk in and go well this feels nice and I like the environment and that you know kitchen looks fab and garden's nice and and that's kind of how you make a decision about your biggest purchase the, the most money that you probably spend as an adult 
Um, whereas when you buy a phone, um, let's see, kind of, you know, go to your phone shop, you kind of research it on the internet, probably find out how long its battery lasts and, you know, what, what the technical people say and other people's reviews and, and, and then you go to the shop and you pick it up and you go, well, that feels heavy, so it's probably good quality, um, which just like a chimp, that's the, the heaviest banana. Um, so you just made a decision on an operating system based on weight. And, and essentially that's how you pick a phone. So you might be do 10 times more research for a, buying a phone, which you probably get rid of in a couple of years, than you would in a house that you might live in for five or 10 or more years, or the partner that you live with or the person you marry. So it's really interesting how, how this works. And, and what's really interesting in terms of the neuroscience, and this is what I was talking about earlier, is our emotional and logical minds that form independently in the womb network together before we're born. And generally, the more primitive the brain, so the monkey brain would be the amygdala, the emotional one, the stronger it is and the harder it is to control um, or dominate. And, and that's there for a reason. So the emotional mind works about, oh, it's thousands of times faster than the rational mind. And it's about five times stronger. They, you know, all the neuroscientists put all those big colanders on people's heads and they measure their emotional responses and they're far more intelligent than me. But basically I've read all that research. And what is really, really fascinating to me is that that emotional chimp mind, the McCoy or the, the emotional mind, gets all of your sensory information first. It gets the sights and the sounds and your experience of people's facial expressions and, and all of that stuff. And it's evolutionary hardwiring designed for our protection. So not only is that emotional brain faster, but it can override the logical human brain because it's built into our survival. So, you know, aside from the effect on willpower, <laughs> you know, I can't resist the cake um, and things like that, the, 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 the real thing is if there was a lion in the room, it wants us running not using logic to determine what the statistical likelihood is of that lion getting us. And the same thing with the mother, it wants us running. And we use that primitive decision-making process to make really complex modern day decisions, including about security. So, you know, this emotional mind is really more suited to judging distance or weight or change because it's 150,000 years old. Now the logical mind, which is the one that we often would like to think that we make decisions on, of course we use that, but it uses a lot of processing power. It loses a lot of energy to do that. So it's something that we have to um, actually choose to engage generally. Um, and that makes sense because otherwise we'd still be sitting in our bedroom trying to decide what pajamas we were gonna put on and, or suit we were gonna wear or outfit we were gonna do and the, implications of, of how people might react to that and you just can't work on logic alone so thankfully the reason i go through all of that is if you can understand that and if you can start to study that and you're interested in either defending against phishing or marketing or using phishing as a tool in your career then you can start to learn about the kind of biases that we have built in to that primate mind. Things like anchoring. So if you're given one piece of information, you anchor the other information relative to it, like a price. Like if I said, oh, that car is 10,000 pounds. And then you go, oh, okay, cars are 10,000 pounds if you've never seen a car. And then it's like, oh, there's a 100,000 pound car. It would seem really expensive. If the first point of price was, 100,000 then a 10,000 car would seem like it's too cheap to be true. So it's that's anchoring and center preference. You know, when people make offers to you and the center one tends to be the one that has the best deal and a whole host more. Um, and there's books like Methods of Persuasion by Nick Kalender or Neuromarketing that, that talk about these biases that we have. And we've got biases in decision-making and biases in thought processes and it's really, really important because in cybersecurity, the criminals and the hackers and the experts in phishing know how to use this stuff. 
So if you want to understand why something is being successful or why something isn't being successful, then we need to know how to use this stuff too, because essentially we're fishing with bananas because this is the, this is the mind that is going to be successful. So people need to understand that we need to um, manipulate others because essentially there's, there's two forms of influence in people. One is influence and you're doing it for their benefit. So that is manipulation for the benefit of the person that you're manipulating is influence. Um, and I'm pretty certain that it would be influence if you were trying to influence your team not to click on things. Whereas if you are doing something to get somebody to click on malware, you are manipulating them because it's in your interest and not theirs. So people who want to manipulate you, essentially what they're trying to do is find your USP and USP you hear about in sales and marketing. It's your unique selling propositions. What things are you tempted by? You know, what problems are you trying to solve? What value are you after at that particular moment in time? And actually phishing is really the reverse of marketing in many ways, because what you're trying to do is add value to those people that you are trying to tempt. So if I look at some of the, the recent campaigns of phishing, so one of the value propositions is information. And the reason that phishing went up so much during the start of um, the sort of COVID and the pandemic and the crisis is people were actively looking for information about COVID risk, about what it might mean to their employment. And solutions to problems is another one. You know, the, I think it was Scott, it's definitely one of the beer farmers recently. They, you know, had masses of people download stuff that potentially could have been containing some nasty payload because he intersected it with, you know, the need for a patch, the need to actually contain malware. And so solutions to problems is another reason that we might click on stuff because it's tempting, it's adding value. And then you've got things that make us feel good or feel like we're part of a pack. So you think about that chimp, um, you know, it's going to be motivated by feeling good. So again, during COVID, there was a lot of stuff um, where people were clicking on things that were fake charity donations because they wanted to feel like they were making a positive contribution to society, to others that might need help. Um, things like membership, that togetherness, um, things like political beliefs. You know, people would click on stuff because they were frightened about the number of people that weren't wearing, wearing masks and they wanted to convince them. So they were clicking on links that said that there was information about why you should wear masks. So really, to, to run a successful phishing campaign, what you're doing is reverse marketing because you're looking at what are people looking for that would be positive and you're using it for negative um, payout pay for you. So again, um, I think Jess Barker and um, Sygenta did something um, for the National Health where they were doing an anti-phishing campaign and they were some of their examples were things like discounts for popular stuff like Starbucks vouchers. Um, and again, that's something that people will click on because it's like, that's the banana, that's the value. Um, another one that were things like salaries, how your salary might be affected during the pandemic. People were actively searching for that kind of information, which meant that the likelihood somebody was going to be successful with a phishing campaign, a very general generic phishing campaign was much higher because you had an active audience. In marketing terms, you had people ready to buy, ready to buy your content. So adding value, if you're somebody who wants to use this for phishing, would be what you'd be trying to do. And if you were trying to do an anti-phishing campaign, then you want to look at what would add value, personal value to the people in terms of your team. So what is their motivation? Because if you can get somebody to be sincerely interested in what you're trying to teach them or get them to do, then obviously you are, you know, nine tenths of the way to reducing the likelihood that you're going to be um, successfully fished as an organisation. So I've talked a little bit about phishing, which is very generic. Um, and then I would 
take that and, and add a notch and say that you've got your, your spear fishing where it's a lot more specific and everybody's got a unique thing. I think I may have seen these at the last B, B sites um, or oh, something like that. <laughs> but essentially spear fishing is like fishing, only it's what is unique to you. So um, obviously social media, a lot of us are on it. A lot of us will have seen this. Um, so what games are you interested in? Have you posted on social media that you're a fan of a certain brand? What could they use against you in terms of you know, are you a fan of Marmite, for example, you be a Marmite discount or whatever it might be. Um, essentially, it is the next step of marketing. It's, it's creating an avatar that is so unique, so um, specific to what you might click on. But the process is the same. What they are trying to do is get you to a yes. And that is an emotional response. So I've kind of done a real whiz through this, this part because there's just too much stuff in, in terms of how a primate brain works. But what I wanted to do is to basically say it's hardwired. There isn't a way we can easily overcome this stuff and certainly not without using specific energy to do it and being quite um, attentive. And then on top of that, there are some very specific things that every successful campaign, whether it's fishing or spear fishing, has. So as well as wanting an emotional response, and again, Jess and FC have covered that, and, and if you want, I can put you a link to their video because it's quite good for sharing with, with non-technical people. But as well as having that emotional response, there are some very specific things that all of the successful stuff has. And that is that you've got a specific enticement. So whether it's payroll info, whether it's there's a download that will help protect you, whether it's a technical person not wanting to write their own code and just wanting to drop some code in from somebody else, whatever it might be, Starbucks vouchers, it's a specific enticement. And if you can, latch on to something that a society like COVID was looking for at the time, those hot buttons where you've got a lot of activity, a lot of eager people looking for what you're selling, then you're going to increase your success. And then a defined action and then a reward. The defined action is generally, in the case of phishing, getting you to log on, getting you to click something, getting you to move that forward. But the reward is really interesting because it's kind of a joint reward because you as a victim perceive that there is a reward or if in the case that you're defending against um, fishing with an anti-fishing campaign, there's a reward for you being compliant and not clicking on stuff. And then there's a reward for either the perpetrator because they get people to click on their links or there's a reward for the company if you're doing anti-fishing because you reduce your risk. So the reward one is, is really interesting because it applies in multiple buckets. But essentially, um, every single successful campaign would fit into this in some way. And, and that's really interesting because then you can start to deconstruct what might work and what um, could be done to circumvent logic and go straight into that emotional um, non-thinking action based response. So I've had some um, examples that actually the anti-social engineer sent over. Here's one. Um, this is actually a, a, one of theirs. It's really, really good. It, it looks like the sort of message that you would typically get from your team. If you've got Office 365, it looks kind of the sort of thing that you'd have as a code obviously this is this is a template email that they use really happy to chat afterwards about why this would work but i would hope just from the conversation that you've had that you would see that the reason this would work is there's nothing to alert you about threat there's nothing that would send that monkey running away thinking there's a lion in here um, it's the sort of thing that people might be expecting to do on a regular basis 
it's the sort of thing that you have predisposed people to do if you've been giving them training and saying that we need to be secure. So it ties into the feeling of security, which of course, as primates, we like. And it's simple because there's only one action. So the, the subject and the reward and the specific action is all kind of there. So this is the sort of one that would be successful because there's no threat that you can see. It looks like the sort of thing that you would normally do. It's a very easy action and you believe that it's from somebody with authority. So there's a load of primate behaviors that would be in this. So this is think fast material, absolutely. Um, another example, so this one's really interesting because this, this plays around with the primates desire to look after their family or for fun and social reward. And this plays right into personal um, reward. So hi, let's say, hi Nicola, despite prior planning, unforeseen circumstances, change the rotor over the Christmas period. Now, any reasonably large company would probably have a rotor for teams over the Christmas period. Um, it wouldn't be that hard to find the HR manager or the manager of that team, because quite often it, it's now public, you know, so teams are on social media, sales teams are on social media. And, you know, or the HR manager to a senior C-suite person. This is the sort of thing that, because people, particularly large organizations, tend to send quite generic type mails that would be of personal interest. So the reward there is I'm interested in this personally. The action is just to click on the Word document. Um, and again, it, it falls into that clearly able to be successful um, methodology. Another one. This one's interesting. This one's a little bit sexy. I love this one because it ties in to change and um, inclusion and exclusion. So one of the things that as primates we want to be is we kind of want to be in that insider circle and we want to know information that we shouldn't have access to because we're always worried about, well, what, what don't I know? And, and this is a marketing technique that people use all the time to try and get you to take action. You know, the um, countdown timers, very similar to this. It's a limited time when you think, well, actually, this shouldn't be shared, so I need to click on it before they take it down. It's kind of that kind of um, movement forward that people would have. So this one's really interesting because you've got that sort of guilty, you know, I'm leaving today, couldn't care less. It's like the amount of people that would potentially click on this um, is quite high. Um, now this one, interestingly, has a double M. So this, this one, the uh, antisocial team were being a little bit kinder because there were some clues that it may not be legit. Um, but there will still be people that will click on it because of that desire to know how you are socially ranked. And a lot of um, things like that comes through your salary and your perceived worth and things like that. And that is very, very much um, tied into primate behavior and, um, and how those uh, um, primate minds work. So hopefully <laughs> all of that has, has given us some conversational topics um, because there's enough people in this room with enough experience of various uh, things that you might have done yourselves to start unpacking this and kind of go, well, how does that relate to primate behavior? How does that relate to logic? How have we circumvented logic and got somebody to do an emotional response that would result in them clicking on it? So in terms of why are we here? Well, some of you work for companies, some of you want to enhance what you do. Um, but essentially why I'm here is we kind of suck at this as an industry. And when we're trying to entice people to take action, we don't learn from what fishing people do or what people who are, are trying to get us to click on stuff do. So they use marketing techniques. They use neuromarketing. They use our inbuilt biases. They use our primate behavior to get us to do what they want us to do. This is what we do. 
So as an industry, our language started in the Cold War and we have so much language of battle in how we try and convince people not to do stuff still that we have a bit of a problem. The reason we've got a bit of a problem is primates do not engage with battle language. Now, I talk about this when I'm talking about marketing to people, because you can you can talk about this stuff. There's, logic and emotion do work together. You, you can't just sell emotionally because people then rationalize with logic the decision they've often already made emotionally. But the reason that I wanted to highlight this is if you are going to be doing training to teams and you've got this kind of stuff, this kind of language in the training that you're doing, you may want to get a company in to help you, or you may want to have a rethink about what you're doing. Because this kind of language, this fear, uncertainty, this doubt that it does generate, creates two things. It creates either I'm doomed and therefore there's no point in me engaging, and they're going to run away from it, even though they might be nodding, they're not necessarily going to be engaged, or they are going to do this. So it's either doomed or nothing to see here. I'm fine. I already know it. And again, it doesn't change the actual behavior. So whatever way you want to look at this, whether you're using this as I need to understand some more of this stuff to improve my fishing success rate, or whether it's I need to understand more of this stuff because I want to market to people, or whether it's I want to understand more of this stuff because I want to do better training or understand what training companies are likely to be successful. We are all in it for the bananas because we're all in it for what's in it for us, whether it's the success that you want, or whether it's the people you want to protect, or the people that you want to manipulate, or the people you want to influence. And, you know, I can't go into all of the different things to do with neuromarketing. And there are far more talented people than me um, that I've spent lots of time studying that have deeper insights. So hopefully this is enough fodder to have a good chat about it and talk about stuff in a, in a, in a way that I can learn some extra stuff as well, because I, I love this subject. Um, but if you haven't come across this sort of stuff before, um, then this is the slide that you might want to screenshot. Thinking fast and slow is about that um, spot brain versus the primate brain, really, because it's how we make decisions. Methods of persuasion and neuromarketing, they're really both marketing books, but if you take what it says in them and you apply it to things like fishing, to things like manipulating people for cybersecurity or influencing people to take better security actions or even buy your kit because it's going to help protect their networks. These are two books that I would really recommend. And the start with why is really because we as an industry so often forget to tell people why we are teaching them or why we want them to look at a certain thing or why we want them to investigate something. And if they don't know the what's in it for you, the why that you're um, following and the why that they might want to listen to you for, then um, you don't tend to get very far. And Start With Why is a, just a great book. Um, and again, it's one that I tend to recommend when, when people are trying to build businesses. So there you go. Hopefully that has um, been a bit of a whirlwind tour um, and we've got kind of 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so to, to unpack it. And hopefully, um, <laughs> hopefully I haven't kind of gone to over the top and you, you followed it all because you're all brilliant. So